Hello and good evening. Thank you so much for joining us for Cocktails in Conversation. My name is Maria Whipple and I'm the, the director of Affinity Networks for the Pretty for Life Foundation. As the director for the Pretty for Life Found, uh, for the Affinity Networks for the Foundation, I help find fun and meaningful ways for all of you to connect back to Purdue. And one of those ways is with Cocktails in Conversation. This evening, I have the wonderful pleasure of welcoming Dr. Uh, Marissa Tremblay to our session this evening. Thank you so much for that wonderful introduction of our guest speaker this evening, Dr. Tremblay. Hi, Maria. Good to be here. Good to be here. Thank you for being here. <laughs> I appreciate you being here. Before we start, I'd like you to kind of explain what those pictures were all about. Sure. So um, I uh, put together a couple pictures uh, of me when I was in Antarctica, which I think uh, is how you found out about me yes. and being here at <laughs> Purdue. Um, so I put some photos in from Antarctica where I recently led um, a field campaign uh, mm -hmm. at the end of 2022. But then I also included some photos of me uh, working in my laboratory mm -hmm. and then also um, some earlier field work and field experiences that I had um, that kind of led me to where I am today. Okay. Yeah. Can you tell us where those um, those expeditions were? Sure. Um, so I included two photos of me doing field work as a graduate student. Mm -hmm. So uh, one of the photos was in southern Tibet or the southern Tibet Autonomous Province. And uh, the other one was in Ethiopia. So my first year in grad oh. school, I got to go to both of those places to do field work, which was pretty spectacular. Yeah. Um, and then I believe I also included um, a photo uh, when I was an undergraduate, I actually did a program called C Semester, where um, instead of doing a regular college semester, I ended up sailing from Hawaii to Tahiti. Um, <laughs> My mouth is dropping every second here. <laughs> uh, okay. And so uh, that was one of the photos. I think you can see that my head was shaved in that photo. Um, that's a sort of hazing tradition that you uh, undergo when you cross the equator. They didn't make everybody do it, but I wanted to do oh, it. And so, fun. yeah, yeah. Ladies, put in the chat if you would uh, follow this tradition of shaving <laughs> your head when you cross the equator. While you do that, um, some people had put questions, some comments in the chat. Let's maybe we could just go through those really sure. quick. Um, okay, we've got people calling in from Michigan, Indiana. Great Rocks, Australia. Oh, okay, that's where you had your, your biggest trip. Do you know that? Oh, I think they were saying they like geoscience means great rocks. Oh, and that okay. their biggest trip in was Australia. Australia. Got mm -hmm. it. Okay. Africa Safari. Good. We've got people from New York. Coolest trip is Wonderful Earth in Jamaica. That's awesome. The no hair thing. <laughs> Thanks, Joanne. You wouldn't do it? <laughs> well, you know, we couldn't shower or have a regular shower for a long time. And so it was actually, it felt so much cleaner to not have okay. a big head of hair. Okay, yeah. <laughs> okay. With you, with your beautiful golden locks there, I was wondering how long did it take you to grow it, some of it back? Or? Um, It probably took a good year before okay. I had like this length hair okay. again. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's pretty fast. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay. With that equator trip. Oh, wow. I was like, can I ask all those questions? But we'll get to those in a minute. But thank sure. you for explaining those pictures. That's awesome. Um, so while we, while I interview her, please feel free to put questions in the chat and uh, we'll get to those uh, periodically throughout the, the tonight's session. So here we go. Um, you are a noble gas geochemist? Yes. <laughs> interested in understanding the physical and chemical processes that shape the surface of the earth and other planetary bodies. Can you condense that and maybe rephrase that? Sure, absolutely. So um, I 
in essence, I'm a chemist, but I look at sort of the chemistry of the natural world. Um, okay. And uh, specifically, I look at these gas atoms that end up um, in rocks and minerals, but they're very unhappy to be there. Um, yeah. So the noble gases are uh, on the periodic table. They're on the far uh, right-hand side, and they don't form bonds with anything. And so mm -hmm. they have a tendency to leak out of rocks and minerals. And we... Uh, actually use that behavior to understand all sorts of different things about the history of those geologic materials. Okay. So, for example, the work that we're doing in Antarctica, we're trying to understand what the past climate in Antarctica has been like, so what temperatures were like there but millions of years ago. Um, so, and it's very cold in Antarctica, so that's like kind of the, some of the coldest work that I do mm -hmm. um, in terms of thinking about the things that rocks have experienced. And then on the other end of the spectrum, I've done work on thinking about, you know, how hot do rocks get on the moon when they get um, hit with a, or hit with a bolide, so creating an impact on the moon, creating a crater. Um, how hot did they get and when did those impacts happen? So that's kind of the other end of the spectrum of like really short and like really, really intense uh, geologic events. Wow. Okay. Yeah. Take us back to your childhood. What got you interested into all that? Um, was it, did it start at childhood or? No, I don't think I found geology or geoscience truly until I was in uh, my first year as an undergraduate. Okay. Yeah, so I think I was always uh, interested in the environment and cared a lot about the environment and about climate change, mm -hmm. more and more so as I sort of approached college. Mm -hmm. uh, and then I went to Barnard College, which is a women's college in New York City. Okay. Um, nice. And uh, when I got to Barnard in my first year, I was th still thinking about environment, environmental science. Uh, but my first year, there was a, a course offered that was a geologic field trip to Death Valley, California. And Fun. <laughs> yeah, so I grew up in New Hampshire in a oh. really small town. And I saw this mostly as, hey, this is an opportunity for me to see a part of the country I hadn't been to before, uh. sort of maybe the inklings of my explorer nature. And so, and it was also heavily subsidized by the university so it was affordable to go mm -hmm, to you mm -hmm, know California mm -hmm. on this trip and so um, I what signed up not because I was super excited about the geology but I was more interested in the experience and then I ended up really loving the science that we were learning about while we were there mm -hmm. um, and so we would be driving around going to different uh, sort of field trip stops or different geologic sites and all the other students would be sleeping and I would be the one like sitting up front asking the professor questions, asking more questions. So that's where things I think really started for me. Okay. Um, and then that summer I ended up working uh, with that professor and another professor uh, and started doing research with them after my first year. So I got a very early start on research and um, it was a great experience. Was yeah. this your freshman year during your undergrad mm -hmm. when you discovered this? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So what did you enroll call it? Um, what was your major when you first enrolled? Was it I started out as environmental science. Okay. Uh, Barnard's a little different from Purdue. I didn't have to necessarily declare that earlier. I didn't, you know, come into a specific college, okay. but I knew that that was the direction that I was gonna okay. go. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Interesting. Ladies, put in the chat if you've been to Death Valley. <laughs> <laughs> what was the what was your first thought stepping on t into? I don't even know how to describe. Death yeah, Valley. I mean, so it's really different in that there's not very much vegetation, right? And mm -hmm. so I had grown up in New England lush. where it's very <laughs> vegetated. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, you've got really snowy winters mm -hmm. and like very lush summers. And so I had, I feel like never thought about geology because it's not something that you really see or it's not, mm. you know, as obvious as when you go out to the West and you're just just looking at expanse of rock. So right. that was definitely the, the first impression okay. that I had. Okay, yeah. not the heat. We went in March, so it was hot, but not terribly hot. You okay. know, you would never want to go there and do work outside all day in July. Yeah. They said, yes, hot, <laughs> Sharon said. No, tell us more about the geology of Death Valley. Yeah, so the geology of Death Valley is really interesting, and that's what I ended up 
starting to do research on after my first year of undergrad, mm -hmm. um, working with that professor, not directly in Death Valley, but in that area. Okay. Um, so this is a part of the continent where uh, there's been lots of what we call extension. So basically, um, uh, that it's a place where the North American plate is sort of being pulled apart and it's being extended, so it's being lengthened. Um, and so in Death Valley, in this broader region called the Basin and Range Province, you get all of these basins and mm -hmm. mountain ranges next to them, basins and ranges, and they sort of form and tell you about the direction that that extension or sort of pulling is mm -hmm. happening. Um, and so uh, that's sort of the most recent geologic history, but it's really cool to go there and visit because there are rocks that are more than a billion years old that are also exposed there. Wow. Um, and so there's a lot of history, geologic history that's exposed. I was working on sort of that most recent extensional piece of it, um, but there's a lot of other cool stuff to see there too. I bet. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Wow, I bet. Okay, well, thank you. Um, we'll go back to this one. So one of your one of the things that you said you wanted that your research focuses on is the impact history of the moon and other planetary bodies in the in the solar system. Mm -hmm. Can you expand on what that means to us? Yeah. Um so uh Earth is really great in terms of geology. I just described, right, there's extension pulling mm -hmm. apart Death Valley. So Earth is a planet that has this process that we call plate tectonics. And plate tectonics is really interesting and fascinating, but it removes the early history of the Earth. So we don't have rocks on the Earth today that tell us about the history of the Earth, you know, four and a half billion years ago when our planet was first forming. All that material has kind of been processed. And so mm. um, we often look to other bodies nearby in the solar system, like the moon, oh. to tell us about that early history of the Earth. Um, one of the things that when I, so I was working on the moon primarily as a, as a postdoc. So uh, like I'll, I'll give a little sort of bio. After Barnard, I went and did my PhD at UC Berkeley. And then I was a postdoc working in Scotland. Uh, and there I was, I started to work on um, lunar samples. And we were really interested in testing this idea that um, the moon and therefore also Earth experienced this period of intense bombardment by meteoroids kind of late in their history. Mm -hmm. um, and that's really important for thinking about the history of life on Earth. It's mm -hmm. hard to imagine that life would have survived this late heavy bombardment. Mm -hmm. And so this is a hypothesis that has been around for a long time, but people that collect the types of data that I collect have been sort of questioning whether or not um, this late bombardment happened. And so that's one of the things that we were interested in seeing is do we, does the evidence for this hold up or can we sort of test this hypothesis in new ways? Um, so it's relevant to thinking about the Earth and mm -hmm. the early history of the Earth and, and life on Earth. Okay. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. So with the rocks that exist on Earth, how far back can we actually see before we have to go to the moon to find out, how, you know, what it looked like before? Yeah, so the oldest rocks are uh, just over 3 billion years old. Okay. Um, now the oldest minerals, so pieces of rock, uh, are older than that. We have minerals that are older than four billion years old, oh. um, but they're found, they're, they've been recycled, right? So there are some minerals, this mineral called zircon, that's just like, you can't get rid of it. It's just like extremely robust. And so there are zircons that are very old that you find in younger rocks. Okay. Yeah. It makes me think of the movies that we see sometimes, and I'm wondering if you say, if sometimes you criticize, that's not right, that's not true as you're watching. Oh, absolutely, yeah, yeah. There's a new movie coming out with Adam Driver. Um, it's okay. about It's about the extinction of the dinosaurs. Okay. And I think they call the movie 65 MA, which MA is millions of years, um, and okay. all of... My geologist friends are like, that's the stupidest name for this movie because we know it didn't happen at 65. It happened at 66.02 something. So they, <laughs> they named the movie the wrong time. Okay. <laughs> the dinosaurs had been gone for a million years by okay. 65 million years oh, ago. They yeah. should have <laughs> consulted with a, geo a geoscientist. It's okay. It's, it's entertaining <laughs> to, you know, poke fun at, I bet, at the movies. I bet, yeah. I bet, I bet. Okay. Well, that's fun. Well, thank you. Um, Talk to us, okay, you talked to us about your college life. How about your postdoc life when you said you were in Scotland? I was in Scotland, yeah. Mm -hmm. So 
Um, I finished my PhD in the summer of 2017, and I had a couple of different options for uh, postdocs. Uh, and he'll probably kill me for telling this story, but I really, <laughs> I, <laughs> I ended up um, sort of following uh, the person who's now my uh, husband. So he was already um, a lecturer in Scotland, which is the equivalent of an assistant professor here. Okay. Um, and I basically found a way to get a postdoc position for myself uh, in Scotland. So I met him in Berkeley um, where he had been a postdoc okay. and then yeah I so I ended up moving to Scotland okay. and then I made him come here to Purdue with me. <laughs> I was wondering how did you both get to Purdue because your husband does work here. Yes yes. yes. Mm -hmm. Okay yeah. What made you decide to come to Purdue then? Um. So both of you I guess. So both of us yeah uh, you know I wanted a tenure track faculty position and okay. I had been interviewing all around and Purdue is the place where I ended up getting an offer okay. um, and Purdue did a really good job of being persistent with us and finding something for my okay. partner mm -hmm. yeah um, it took a while um, but in the end we found something that worked for both of us and okay. yeah so interesting yeah. because both of you are I believe in the same yeah he's also a geochemist yep. okay yeah okay okay do you sometimes collaborate on work together? Yep, we yeah. have. We've, I think we have one paper published okay. together and a couple of uh, conference proceedings. Oh, fun. Um, yeah. Oh, that's fun. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Well, thank you. So that's what brought you here. Um, can you share us more about the work that you do, you're doing right now at Purdue, some of your research projects that you're involved with? Yeah, so I can tell you a little bit more about the Antarctica project. Okay. Um, so for this project, we're interested in looking at the climate in Antarctica's past, but we want to go back before we had ice cores. So ice cores are one of the most uh, amazing records for looking at what their past climate was like. Um, but our oldest ice cores from Antarctica only go back to about one million years ago. So we can, we can go back pretty far. We can go back um, and see that 20,000 years ago, for example, we had big ice sheets in the northern hemisphere. So Lafayette, West Lafayette, would have been covered under thick, thick ice. Um, and wow. uh, <laughs> today, that ice isn't here. Mm -hmm. um, and so we've seen the planet go undergo these glacial, interglacial periods. Um, and that's all recorded in ice cores, and that's great. But they only go back one million years. And we were interested in this time period um, about three to 3.3 million years ago, uh, because that's the last time we had concentrations of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere that are similar to today. Mm -hmm. So if we're thinking about, okay, where is our planet heading in terms of climate change? That's sort of our, our closest place we can look in the past to mm -hmm. say, all right, we had CO2 similar to today. Sea levels were much, much higher. Mm -hmm. um, and so we know the climate was much warmer on our planet. But we don't actually know how warm Antarctica was. We don't have any sort of direct evidence or data from ice cores or other geologic records to say Antarctica was this much warmer. Um, and so that's what we're trying to do there is to provide one of those records of how warm Antarctica was during this sort of key time in the Earth's climate past. I'm trying to imagine, what is, what is it like the temperatures that we're experiencing or living through right now? Is that similar? You're not able to tell us if that was... Like well, so I, a good way to think about it, we live in a place where we have like, yeah, it's cold here in the winter time and warm in the summer. And so we do have these big um, uh, shifts that are seasonal in our mm -hmm. temperatures, but we're looking at kind of how much the average shifts. Um, and it seems like a small thing, but actually for the planet, a small shift of a few degrees in the average has sort of big consequences mm -hmm. for all sorts of things like the extreme weather that we have, um, you know, how much heat stress we have in the summer. That's a big one that we worry about here. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, in polar regions, we think that there's more warming or that the average was higher than at lower latitudes, like near the equator. Um, and so there's an even bigger sort of shift in that average associated with these warmer periods in the past. So it's not it's not huge. It's not the magnitude of going from like winter to summer here in Lafayette. But that change in the average is really important for sort of all sorts of downstream effects. Yeah. It, it kind of surprised, well, not surprising, but when you said Lafayette was in sheets of ice. Yeah. Okay. Oh, absolutely. Yep. Yeah. We, this would have been buried by, you know, hmm. maybe a mile of ice. Yeah. 
it's incredible. super thick. Yeah, yeah. It's incredible that you're able to through the geoscience do that. Wow, that's incredible. Um, ladies, please feel free to put your questions in the chat, um, and we will monitor those regularly. Um, so, with what were some of the most fascinating findings in your research in Antarctica? Something well, that's that a great question. Mm -hmm. um, so we haven't learned a lot yet, in part okay. because we were doing the field work in late 2022, and then we collected a bunch of rocks, but those rocks took a really long time to get here. <laughs> oh, okay. Um, so we got the rocks sort of in early to mid-April, and okay. so, you know, we need to do a lot of work in the laboratory before we're able to start to say things about what the, okay. the climate was like. Yeah. Okay, okay. Yeah. And the pandemic was really, you know, I started in fall 2019 at Purdue and the pandemic was oh. not not great for people that need to do <laughs> field work for their science because, yeah. it, you know, we didn't go anywhere for a few years. Mm -hmm, so, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Now the chips are ramping up again, I think. <laughs> okay, well, awesome. Um, aside from your Antarctica trip, what, are, what other um, research or areas are you interested in? Yeah, in so future? I... I feel like I'm maybe a little bit um, all over the place in terms of the <laughs> types of things that I work on. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, one of my uh, graduate students, we're working on um, a volcanic province called the Deccan Traps. Um, and so the Deccan Traps, it's a very, very large, basically, pile of lava flows in India. And it erupted across this time period when the dinosaurs went extinct. And so people have called on or started to ask a lot of questions about what role did this large amount of volcanism that happened in a really short time period play mm -hmm. in that mass extinction. Um, and so what we're working on with um, one of my grad students here and then a, a colleague who's at the University of Florida is actually trying to quantify the amount of time between lava flows. So you have one lava flow happen and then there's some time before it gets buried by another lava flow. And we're trying to figure out how long those hiatuses are basically between the flows. Um, yeah, so we did extreme field work in 2022 yeah. in that we went to Antarctica, which was very cold. <laughs> I was gonna say. And then we were in India in May, and it was over 100 degrees every oh day my. and very humid. It was, I, that I feel like was in some ways more physically challenging than Antarctica mm. because it was so hot. Yeah. Because you can always dress warmer, you, know, you can't really, it's hard to, yeah, keep, it's hard to, to dress down. Yep, okay. yeah. Especially that. Wow, <laughs> you really picked the extremes there within a period yeah. of five months. And again, <laughs> COVID, we would have not okay. done them oh, okay. at, so in the close. same, mm, yeah, okay. exactly. Um, it's a bit toxic working with volcanoes. I mean, how close can you get? I get are you wearing like equipment because of the, the so toxins it releases? These lava flows are many millions of years old. Okay. So yeah, they're f totally fine to be around today. Okay. Um, I currently don't do any work on like active volcanoes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. okay. I guess that's what I was more thinking about because I'm from the Philippines and we've got them all over the place. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, you do. I mean, depending on, you know, the type of volcano and sort of what phase of its I don't know, life cycle mm -hmm. it's in, you do have to worry about getting really close and like okay. breathing in Got it. Yeah, certain okay. gases. Okay. Yeah. I forgot these were millions of years old <laughs> that you were mentioning. Well, that's interesting. Do you bring students along to these trips? Yes, yeah. So um, I had uh, one of my PhD students, Emily Appel. Um, so her PhD research is focused on the Antarctica work. Okay. Um, so she was with us in Antarctica. Um, and then I had an, another PhD student, Mo Mejum. Um, okay. So Mo is involved in the um, the Deccan Traps project and came to India. Oh, yeah. Okay. So most of my students have, you know, a field component where they go out and get their samples and then a lot of time in the lab where they spend okay. time processing those samples. Yeah. That's fun. How long was your trek in Antarctica in, in and then also your trip in India? How long did you usually last? Uh, so we were in Antarctica for a about, I was gone for about six weeks. Um, okay. Yeah, so that was a long, it's, it takes a long time to get there. <laughs> so you, you make the most of the time that you're there. Wait, uh, plan out the trip. What, is that, what does that look like, going from West Lafayette to Antarctica? How do you? Oh, I don't even know if I could. My flights, <laughs> both going there and coming back, got messed up. So going there, I flew from Indianapolis to Los Angeles, mm -hmm. Los Angeles to Sydney, Australia. Wow. And then okay. Sydney to Christchurch, New Zealand. Okay. And then in New Zealand, you get um, you spend a few days there doing a few trainings, but then also getting all of your specialized gear. Okay. So you know the big red parkas that you've yeah. seen everybody wear in Antarctica, <laughs> they don't give those to you. But 
you do borrow them. Okay. <laughs> so you don't get to keep them, but you do borrow them, and you mm -hmm. get all that stuff down in New Zealand. Mm -hmm. And then from Christchurch, you fly to um, McMurdo, which is the U.S. Uh, Antarctic Program Station down in Antarctica. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Wow. So it takes a long time to it get there. It's about three days. And then, yep. did you have, and then to acclimate, not that word, but to get back into West Lafayette and the climate again. Mm -hmm. How long did that take you to adjust? Um, so I, when I came back from McMurdo, so you go back to Christchurch, I spent a few days in New Zealand. Okay. Kind of, you know, a little vacation. Bit. Yeah. Oh, got it. Okay. Um, and, then, uh, and then I flew back to the States. Um, okay. Yeah. To get recover from the jet lag, I, I don't know how long it takes. It's more days. the jet lag or more yeah. the, temp with the temperature, I was thinking. Um, you, was how, what was the temperature in Antarctica? So it's pretty cold, but it is the summertime f there, oh, okay. right? So um, one for one thing, it's daylight 24-7, which definitely helps oh. it be a little bit warmer. <laughs> okay. Um, and, you know, we had days where, like, I wouldn't be out necessarily in a t-shirt, but I definitely wasn't wearing like a jacket okay. at all times. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Just the psychology of having daylight the whole entire day night. That must take some adjustment. It is tough. And, it, you know, because you can work all the time if yeah. it's always light out. Yeah. Um, so, you know, when we were in McMurdo Station living in the dorms, we did like have blackout mm. shades and stuff. And so it was possible but for example, um, my roommate, who was a professor at the University of Colorado Boulder, and she she does really cool research. Uh, but she was often working night shifts, and so like she and I have like opposite schedules, okay. and so okay. um, it's definitely definitely tough. And then when we were camping out in the field, you know, you can bring like an eye mask, and you just have to like set rigid schedules mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. be able to kind of shut down right yeah but right. it's not easy no it's not i have a friend that was invited to like antarctica and also to stay there for six months i think it was antarctica i don't well but the psycholo psychological mm -hmm. training that you need to be able to last that yeah. long it's it's i think it's tough i think the trickier thing there are people that winter over so you know there are no flights between mm. march and maybe early early october and those people are in darkness for six months oh i think that's a lot harder <laughs> i'm curious ladies would you be able to stay in a place where there was no <laughs> um where it was on daylight the whole time or night time the whole time does the government support this work or is it mostly corporate or other example who sponsors this type of work oh um so the work in antarctica is sponsored by the national science foundation oh, NSF. yeah mm -hmm. okay. nice. yes yeah. yeah most of my research funding comes from nsf okay yeah okay Curious to know the comparison of geology in Scotland with that of Appalachia, development of whiskey bourbon. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, so, yeah, I mean, on opposite sides of the Atlantic Ocean, you kind of have shared geologic history before the opening of the Atlantic Ocean. And um, so you've experienced a lot of the same mountain building events on, on both sides. Um, and I, I okay. have done a lot of whiskey tours in Scotland, particularly when like family and friends come to visit. That's of kind of the, the default <laughs> that you do when you live that. there. <laughs> Um, and I also did the Bourbon Trail in Kentucky. Uh, yeah, I think right. the geology probably does play an important part in terms of like the water that's going into the process. Mm. Um, but I don't know enough about it to say any more than that. <laughs> <laughs> that's fun. Well, I invite you next time to see if you if you are going to go into that area. That would be fun to hear. Mm -hmm. How far south did the glaciers go in North America? Oh, yeah, so we're pretty close to um, where this big ice sheet sort of terminated in North America. So um, we're, we're close to the margin. But, yeah, basically all of Canada would have been covered and the northern U.S., yeah. So a good marker, um, Long Island is this kind of yeah. linear, like, long island. Uh, and that is basically a big pile of sediment that was left behind by the ice sheet. So that was the terminus of the ice sheet oh, okay. um, on the East Coast. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. Well, there you go, Joanne. That's the answer there. And Susan asked, tell us more about the Department of Earth, Atmosphere, and Planetary Science. Now, many, you know, like, for example, the, how many faculty, postdoc students, degrees offered, et cetera. Yeah. So uh, I started in fall 2019, and I feel like maybe not half, but many, many faculty have been hired since since I started. Okay. Our department has grown. Uh, it's grown a lot, although my more senior colleagues tell me that it's kind of 
reached its like maximum size that it's ever been. So it's been as big as it is now. We have about 40 faculty. Um, and yeah, there's been a ton of hiring in the last few years. I think you can see that across the College of Science as a whole. I think mm -hmm. something like 30% of the faculty have been hired in the last wow. five years. Um, and so that means that we're, um, we're very early career. And I think it's great because the early career faculty bring a lot of energy and mm -hmm. excitement and ideas, mm -hmm. sometimes too much energy, like myself included. <laughs> um, but it's, it's, it's really great to have such, you know, a large cohort of people that all mm -hmm. started around the same time as mm -hmm. me because we all face the same similar problems mm -hmm. and obstacles that we're trying to figure out together. So um, yeah, about, about 40 faculty graduate students, I think we're somewhere between like 80 and 100 now. So we've definitely grown the graduate student population oh. too. Okay. Um, postdocs as well. When I started, there was maybe one or two postdocs. And now I think we've got like more than a dozen. So um, that's really good. And then undergrads, we have a few hundred. I don't know the exact number. Um, the planetary science major has just exploded. So planetary is sort of the big thing that's happening in the department. Yeah, <laughs> right now and will continue to be the big thing. I think you, yes, you definitely bring a lot of energy. And I think it's also extremely motivating for students to say, oh, they just did all this. This is something that we can aspire to or maybe work on a project with, you know, yeah. after we mm -hmm. finished our, grad, you know, our degree. So I think it's wonderful. That's exciting. And to, to nearly more than double since you've been here? Maybe not more that? than double, okay. but there have been a lot of people hired. It's something like five or six every year. New okay. people have come in. So, yeah. That's a big organization shift, isn't mm -hmm. it? Mm -hmm. <laughs> every time. Yeah, and then, you know, this semester we had two searches within our department, and then, like, okay. we're part of a couple of cluster hires with other departments. Okay. So maybe we'll have six more people start in the fall. I am not. I don't know yet, but <laughs> uh, it's, it's exciting. Okay. Yeah. And you're... And you're the experienced one that everyone's going to turn to and say, how does this work? Et it's it's funny. Yeah, I feel like I am more one of the more senior junior people. <laughs> <laughs> senior junior, I love that. Is this, this, is this department under something else, School of, someone's asking? Oh, yeah, we are in the College of Science okay. at Purdue. Yep. Can you briefly describe how you began studying the rocks? What, what, specifically, Joanne? Oh, I don't know. Joanne, if you want to specify, I don't know if you had made something alluded to the study of rocks earlier. I can't recall. Um, well, I talked about how I got into geology. Mm -hmm. um, I was from Death Valley. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I love that story. So that's how she began is through um, her trip at Death Valley. The night owl might make it. The night owl might make it. Yeah. I mean, I think <laughs> they do, for the people that are going to winter over, there is... We all undergo um, physical evaluation to assess, like, you know, if you go to Antarctica, there's no dentist down there. And mm. so you need any teeth issues have to be addressed before you go down. But I think for the people that winter over, they also assess, you know, yeah, psychologically, are you going to be able to survive this? Because there are no planes from mm -hmm. the end of March to the beginning of October. And so, you know, yeah. <laughs> I've heard that the hardest part, one of the hardest part is how silent it is, how mm. quiet it is. Mm -hmm. And apart from all day or all night, it's just how quiet everything is. It definitely is when you're out in the field. There's, you mm -hmm. know, aside from the people that have decided to set up these research stations, there's really not a lot that lives down there. So mm -hmm. it is very quiet. Yeah. Mm -hmm. silence. Yeah. But McMurdo Station is actually quite bustling. They're doing a lot of construction. And so okay. um, it kind of felt... it. It's it's like very much like a small town. I was gonna say, yeah. how, how many people are stationed at McMurdo? That's a good question. I think when I left, there was more than a thousand people. I don't oh. know how many more. Okay. Yeah, and most of the people that are there are not scientists. So most of the people are there to help keep the research station functioning. Okay. Yeah. Um, it's okay. a pretty unique experience. Yeah, I actually met a guy um, who is from Lafayette. Uh, yeah. Small world. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Um, yeah. And he, I hope, I'm trying to remember what he did. Um, I want to say that he was, a, he drove one of the big pieces of equipment down okay. there, but yeah, yeah. Well, that's fun. It, yeah, <laughs> mm -hmm, absolutely. That's fun, that's fun. Well, thank you. So keep the questions coming if you still have more questions about um, geoscience, but we're going to go ahead into the second part of the questions here, is women in power. You even had that written up in your bio when you decided to, when you agreed to 
um, participate in cocktails and conversation. Can you address some of your experiences as a leader in this male-dominated profession? Yeah, um, it was funny when I was walking over here to meet you, I was mm -hmm. thinking about this and, you know, I'm fairly young for someone in my position. I'm 32, right? So I started my faculty job at 28. Mm -hmm. um, and I think, you know, I've had a lot of experiences where I mm. would say I was treated differently. And I think as I've gotten older, I've been become more and more perceptive of, you know, when that's because of my gender. Um, I think when I was younger, I would often assume that I was being treated differently because I was young, right? People were treating me as inexperienced because I was young mm -hmm. um, or not an expert because I was young. Mm -hmm. But I more and more, um, in, in, in I think maybe it comes with repeated experiences and, you know, consents when, when those sorts of things happen. Yeah, it is, it is really difficult. You know, I can look at my own department until this April when the tenure and promotion announcements came out, we had one woman who was a full professor. Oh, wow. Um, oh, wow. <laughs> and so that changed. We, we have our, our second woman who was promoted, which is very exciting. And she's a, she's a close friend, so I'm very mm -hmm. happy for her. But yeah, it, it's tough because you, you know, I can look at my sort of closest environment, which is my department, and there's not a lot of women at the top. Um, there's a lot of us at the bottom, mm. <laughs> sort of at the assistant professor level. Um, and so, you know, you feel very optimistic that things will evolve, right, as, as time progresses. But then you also say, well, it's 2023. It's, it's still mm. surprising that there's only one woman who's okay. at that level. Has it been traditionally like that in this field? Yes, yeah. Yes. It's like that uh, in most places, in I would say everywhere time. that I've been, yeah. When I was an undergraduate, so I was at Barnard College, but Barnard is part of Columbia University. Mm -hmm. So I took classes at Columbia and I did research at this um, research institute called Lamont Doherty Earth Observatory. Um, and one of my mentors, one of my research mentors, her name is Sydney Hemming. Um, she was the first woman to go from assistant to associate to full in that department. There had been women who had been hired in at at higher levels, mm -hmm. but she was the first one to go up through that process. Right. And that happened when I was a student, and okay. which wasn't that long ago, right? Wow. Um, so okay. I do see it kind of everywhere, yeah. Okay, okay. And I was thinking because you were, you went to a all women's college, you pop, did, they, they did, did they even talk about this? I'll warn you that this is a field that's dominated by, by men, et cetera? It's definitely something that I was aware of, but I think actually, being at a women's college was a huge benefit to me okay. because I was surrounded by a lot of like powerful and mm. successful women. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's, you know, I was exposed, maybe not in my immediate field, but um, to a lot of women that were highly successful in that mm -hmm. environment. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think that was important to have that exposure at that point in my okay. yeah, education. Well, that's a positive point. Um, so can you give us an example of how you approached a situation when you found yourself the only person at the table? The only woman at the table? Yeah. Only a woman at the table, <laughs> yes. Um, so it's funny, I was, uh, I had dinner with a colleague in my department last night and she, we were talking about um, sort of like what the traditional markers for success are, at least in academia. Mm -hmm. And she said to me, well, I don't want you to take this the wrong way, <laughs> but you, Marissa, have been very good at like doing, being successful at what would be considered the traditional markers that were defined by like a mm -hmm. white male many generations, right? Um, and so uh, I think that that has helped me in a lot of ways and that, you know, I'm sort of doing the, th not doing the things that the guys do, but I'm, you know, I've been able to identify what has conventionally or traditionally been seen as successful and sort of like mm. at least meet some of those uh, metrics so that okay. I, I, I gain the respect of, you know, my colleagues. Okay. Um, I'm not sure if that really answers the question though of what happens when I'm the only yeah, uh, woman, woman at the at table. The table. Um, you know, one thing that as an early career person or as an assistant professor, one of the best things about becoming an assistant professor is that I get to choose who I work with now. 
I didn't always get to choose, right? Like okay. as a graduate student, you know, I had to work with certain other people um, who were maybe part of the grant or whatever. Mm -hmm. But now I'm in a position where I get to choose and I'm often choosing to work with like, you know, people like. <laughs> the people I like. So yeah, so um, this project that I mentioned in India, mm -hmm. that's a project funded with a woman who I went to graduate school with, okay. who is also a close friend. Um, and, you know, we had started talking about this idea as graduate students. And mm -hmm. then when we both got faculty jobs, said, well, let's, let's do, do this. It. Let's write the proposal <laughs> and get it funded. Yeah. Um, okay. So I do try to create a network around me of both people who are you know, like-minded, but then also who are maybe like in similar situations to me okay. so that we can bring each other up. Yep, you uplift each other. Yeah. Okay, mm -hmm. that's another way that you can approach it, right? Yeah, yeah. Okay, okay wonderful, thank you. Um, did you have anyone in particular, or maybe more than one, who was your inspiration to be a leader in your area and why? Yeah, well, so I mentioned that I worked with um, Sydney Hemming at Lamont Doherty Earth Observatory. She is also a noble gas geochemist, so okay. that's where I sort of cut my teeth. Uh, I wouldn't say, you know, when I worked in Sid's lab, I spent most of the time in the basement crushing rocks. It was like not a glory, okay. you know, a, a glorified thing. It was definitely, um, you know, I got to do some of the tedious work that mm -hmm. is kind of, you know, par for the course for an undergraduate, but I definitely mm -hmm. very much looked up to her you know, as I went through my undergraduate degree and, um, you know, I ended up doing a very similar thing in terms of like the type of science that I do. We mm -hmm. work on different sorts of things, but I definitely looked to her. She mm -hmm. was one of the first people that I sort of looked up to as someone that I wanted to be like. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Are you still in contact with Sydney? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. We, we might start working on a project oh, together fine. so <laughs> okay what would that be um so she uh and uh someone who is also at Lamont are interested in looking at these um terraces in the Salton Sea um so this is like like Baja California okay. um and there are these terraces um so terraces are basically these sort of flat areas that represent here they represent a former beach and they've been uplifted because of the um, tectonic processes that are happening in this area, um, but they're interested in dating. So, you know, these terraces that are really high have mm -hmm. to be older than the lower ones, and mm -hmm. we want to try and date how old these terraces are. Yeah, so that's wow. what we've been talking about doing together. Well, that's fun. Mm -hmm. Will that be the first project that you've worked on together then since you've become a professor? Since undergrad, yeah. Okay. Yeah. I still get uh, hassled. I haven't published my undergraduate research, and oh. it's like publishable, <laughs> so it's it's been a long time, yeah. Okay. <laughs> but um, so in theory, we will one day write okay. or publish that paper together, <laughs> but this would yeah, be the first new thing. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, that's fun. Yeah. That's fun. Um, given that this is a male-dominated field, what strategies can, you know, universities do to promote inclusion in the workplace? Or, I mean, there's ageism, I assume, mm -hmm. and then there's mm -hmm. also, you know, a female-male dominance there. So... Is there any kind of strategy that they could implement, we could implement in whole, in general? Yeah, I mean, I think uh, there are women at senior levels in my field, right, at other places. And so, you know, I would love to see some of those women. You know, we have a, f a few in my department, but if we could, like, attract more of those people, I think that would be great. You know, they would provide mentorship for yeah. early career people like me. Mm -hmm. um, but I also, I, you know, I would say particularly in the last few years, rely a lot on my peer or near peer mentors sort of informally. So okay. the people that are at a similar career stage to me Got it. in my department. Um, I don't know, though, how, yeah, how could the university foster something more, yeah, more, more formal there? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um yeah, I'm not sure. I mean, I think it's tough, too, coming out of the pandemic because any sort of social thing where you would bring people f together from across the college stopped for a while or across the university. Mm -hmm. I think that's starting to happen again. And I have made connections to other faculty outside of my own department. Mm -hmm. um, but, like, we're still figuring out how to do that, right, <laughs> I think. Right. Um, so, yeah. Got it. You said there were 40 faculty members of that. How many are women? Oh, um, I would, 
that's a good question. I don't think it's half, but I want to say there's probably 15. Okay. Yeah. I could like count pretty quickly, but that would be my guess is something okay. like 15. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Well, thank you. That You talked about mentorship. So um, that's the next section is... Um, I know you've given some examples. Maybe you can give an additional example of how women can support other women. I know that you talked about doing research projects together yeah. with, with your friend in India. Is it India? Yeah, mm -hmm. you brought her to mm -hmm. India with you. It was your grad, um, friend in graduate school. But what other ways? Yeah. Could it be? One thing, one experience that I had recently that I, I maybe had, like, read about in terms of, like, women in leadership or mentorship, but I hadn't experienced in such a, like, powerful way is – being in a meeting, being in a committee meeting where mm -hmm. another woman hears what you said and decides to amplify what you said. Oh, nice. I had never quite experienced it. And then, yeah, something happened recently where, you know, and it was a, a, a senior woman um, who basically said, hey, don't forget that Marissa brought this up and this is a really important point and we need to make sure that I we address that. this. Um, because, yeah, mm -hmm. based on who else was in that room, you know, no one else was going to go to bat and, like, advocate right. for me. Um, and so I think that's a really, really important thing to do. And, you know, I need to be more conscious of doing that for the, you know, for the women that I'm mm -hmm. around. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. It's tough when you're all early career. You know, you're all a little more vulnerable. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, yeah, no, that was that was really powerful. But to give credit where credit is due, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I love that that someone amplified, like you said, what you had mentioned or um, suggested. That's awesome. Um, what are you a mentor? Are you currently a mentor for? Uh, like, as a professor, I would imagine that you have students. Under, under, under yeah, so I do. I have three graduate students right okay. now, um, and one postdoc, and then we're kind of going to shuffle. So I have a graduate student. He's a master's student. He's defending in two weeks, two weeks Hi. from tomorrow. Um, so he'll <laughs> he'll uh, sadly be leaving. He's going on to do a PhD at Boise State. Okay. Um, and then uh, I have two new graduate students coming in the fall and another postdoc starting in June. So I think I'll be kind of at capacity. <laughs> you know, some people at Purdue, like, have these super groups with 25 students and 10 postdocs. And I don't know how, like, at that point, you're you're only a manager. And yeah. I feel like with a group of four people that I mentor, mm -hmm. I'm already, like, mostly a manager. And so mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I don't know how people do it when they have groups that large. But it'll be a little bit larger this fall. Okay. Yeah. So those are people that, you know, I have, um, you know, formal advising relationships with. But I also see myself as a mentor, both formally and informally, in terms of their career progress. Okay. Um, and then I think, you know, within my department, with the other sort of early to mid-career stage women, I also think that we have peer mentorship. Um, okay. That's really important. Is so. that something that's done informally? Yeah, it's pretty, I would say it's 100% informal. informal. Okay, yeah. that you mm -hmm. do your check-ins with them. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. Yeah. Um, some questions here from Joanne. Thank you, Joanne. Um, Is it this one piece of advice? Yeah, yeah so... Um, you know, I think that being uh, an advocate for yourself is really mm -hmm. important. And that can be really tough when you're, you know, the only one or one of a few. Mm -hmm. um, I think, you know, one of the reasons that I have been successful is that I kind of went for the things that I wanted, mm -hmm. you know, without second guessing myself mm -hmm. I, I did second guess myself I mean that's not fair but you know you have to put yourself out there if you mm -hmm. want the opportunities to come to you and so you know I've I've had a lot of opportunities but I've also been pretty good about just pursuing and like applying for things and mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. going for things because you never know mm -hmm. if you're if they're gonna stick so right um right. yeah I love that Sometimes it's also just identifying what that goal is. Because mm -hmm. a lot of people are kind of like, I don't know exactly. I'm just right. going to follow and see what else is going to be happening. But you had a goal in mind. Did you know about the age of 28 that this is what you were going to be doing or that age or about that age? Do you have like a roadmap? Yeah. Um, so I don't think I decided I wanted to pursue graduate school until maybe like three quarters of the way, my junior year oh, really? of, of undergrad. Okay. Yeah. Um, part of what was helpful is that 
I had that research experience mm -hmm. with um, Sydney at Lamont, um, but then I also, um, during my sophomore and junior year summers, I went and did research experiences in other places. Mm -hmm. So I did different types of science, worked with different people. Mm -hmm. um, and so I learned what I liked and what I didn't like. Mm -hmm. And so that was really useful mm -hmm. for me thinking about what I wanted to go on and do in graduate school. Okay. I think if I hadn't had a couple of different experiences, I probably would have thought about taking time off because, you know, graduate school is a big commitment. Yes. You know, you're, you're going to make not a lot of money for <laughs> a, a while. Mm -hmm. um, and so mm -hmm. uh, I feel like I was fortunate to f kind of figure out the direction I wanted to be going in mm -hmm. by the time I finished undergrad. Mm -hmm. Did I know I wanted to be a faculty member? I think every first year PhD student says that that's like something that they want to do or something that they're okay. open to do. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think I went in thinking that's what I would do, but I was definitely open to po other possibilities kind of okay. throughout the experience. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Oh, well, that's mm -hmm. fun. Okay. There we go, Joanne. Thanks so much for this. In okay. Um, publish your undergraduate work, someone <laughs> says. I know. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Let's get a yes and thumbs up, please. <laughs> let's do that. Okay. Awesome. Oh, my goodness. We've got six minutes. Um, okay. We'll go to really quick for audience, other audience questions besides the one they've asked here. How does, um, which land masses are currently sinking? Oh, um, well, there aren't. Uh, entire landmass. Well, that's not true. Uh, Kiribati, I think I mentioned this when we met previously. So mm -hmm. uh, Kiribati is an island nation. It's if you look at where the international date line is, so where you switch days, mm -hmm. it kind of does this weird jog in the Pacific Ocean, and that's so that the island nation of Kiribati is all on the same day. Okay. Um, so that is a place. You know, there are lots of islands like that that are sinking. It's projected to be the first place to kind of disappear because oh. of rising sea level rise. Okay. Okay. But then there are other places like, you know, New Orleans is part of North America, but um, New Orleans and that, that part of Louisiana is sinking and going to continue to sink. Mm. Yeah. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Pretty rapidly. Pretty rapidly. And we always think about like, is it Venice? Mm, the Netherlands Venice is under, also, yep, yep. underwater. Mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. so, but the Netherlands has been able to control that with their some of the machinery. That they yeah, I mean, some places have done better engineering mm -hmm. than, okay. than others, yeah. Okay. The next question from someone that I, I mentioned is, where is the most earthquake-prone place on Earth? Oh, the most earthquake prone. Well, depends if you mean like most frequent or yes. most destructive. Oh. Because those are maybe. probably different. Well, maybe both. Yeah. Most frequent then? What would that be? Oh, gosh. Let me think. A um, place with lots and lots of seismic activity. I mean, maybe they are the same. So, like, for example, like um, uh, Alaska is a place that has earthquakes all the time because of what the tectonic plate know. boundary looks like there. Okay. Um, yeah. Interesting. We're well, thinking California. Okay. <laughs> California you, also has a lot of earthquakes. <laughs> Can you explain the phenomenon about underwater volcanoes? How do they happen? Yeah. Yeah. So uh, actually, uh, there is an entire mountain range beneath the seafloor, or beneath, sorry, at the seafloor beneath the oceans um, called the Mid Ocean Ridge. And this is a place where the tectonic plates are pulling apart. Mm -hmm. And when that happens, that allows the material that's underneath to decompress. It experiences less pressure, mm -hmm. and it can melt. And so there are um, volcanic eruptions happening along the entire length of the Atlantic Ocean. Um, they're just uh, not dramatic. You know, they're mm -hmm. not Mount St. Helens, but there's okay. constantly volcanic material being okay. produced there. Yeah. It's actually beautiful if you watch it. I mm -hmm. mean, uh, videos of it. That's so... When will Asia and America collide? Oh, gosh. I I mean, so currently they're not moving towards one another. So I don't think I can predict that. Okay. But yeah, not okay. any time in the geologic future. Okay. Okay. Um, that was, I think that was the questions that I picked up from colleagues here. Thanks so much. Okay. Are your parents siblings or relatives in academia? Uh, no, I don't have any parents, siblings, or uh, relatives in academia. Your role models growing up? Yeah, so my parents were definitely role models, mm -hmm. uh, very hard workers, mm -hmm. um, but, and, you know, are, have dealt with me doing all of these crazy things and going to all of these crazy places. Yeah. Yeah. Um, 
yeah, so they have definitely been a, a huge support system for me as oh. I've pursued all of these things. I love that. I love that. Okay. Well, thank you. This brings us to the last part of our session this evening. So before I go to the lightning round, if get ready if you if you want to participate. Is there are there any last words you'd like to share with us tonight? Uh, I guess I'll say that, you know, I've only been at Purdue for four years, but I have felt felt very supported while I've been here. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think that's really important. It's easy it's easy being a woman of few to dwell on the mm -hmm. things that have, you know, not gone as great as one would have hoped. But I, you know, I feel like my time here at Purdue, I've been extremely well supported by my department, by my college. And so, yeah, I've been very happy to be an assistant professor here. And the Purdue community loves that you're here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Love hearing your story. So thank you for that. Thank you. Okay. We're up to the lightning round, which was two minutes left. Okay. So I'll just shoot off a series of questions. Okay. And yeah, fast, you can get to all of them. Okay. Okay, here we go. Um, are we ready with that picture? Okay. Favorite cocktail? Oh, uh, Negroni. Oh, okay. Um, three words to describe the picture of the cat that you sent me. Uh, cute, sharp claws, goofball. <laughs> cute. <laughs> Most beautiful stone? Oh, quartz. What is the most common question you get asked as a geoscientist? Uh, most common question they get asked, uh, how old is the Earth? Okay. Go to weekend pastime. Running. Learn by, learn by watching or learn by doing? Oh, by doing. Um, coolest planet? Earth. Okay. Uh, your super strength is? Uh, telling it like it is. Okay, I love <laughs> it. Favorite noble gas and why? Oh, helium. It's the most useful. Okay. What are your must-haves when trekking in rugged terrain? Um, water mm. and probably a raincoat. Okay. <laughs> most beautiful volcano? Uh, let's go with Erebus. That's the one right by the station in Antarctica. Oh, okay, okay. Number of continents traveled to? Seven. Okay, all of them. <laughs> Favorite geoscience themed movie? Oh, um, that's a good question. San Andreas. I'll take that one over, okay. Um, a place you'd like to visit again and why? I would love to go back to Ethiopia because the people that we interacted with during field work were some of the nicest okay. in the world. Thank you. What makes you hopeful? Um. I think, you know, the students and the younger generation. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Would you rather travel to the past or to the future? Oh, uh, maybe the past. <laughs> okay. Top three locations you'd like to do your research in? <sighs> that I haven't? Uh, I really want to do work in Australia, in okay. Southeast Australia. Okay. okay. Um, I would love to go back to Chile. Okay. Um, and a third place. Uh, probably somewhere in the Arctic, maybe oh. Greenland. Okay. Yeah. Okay. A few more minutes, everyone. Okay, just round, it, round this up. If you could speak to anyone, who would it be? <sighs> to anyone. Anyone. Why would it help? Obama. Okay. Okay. <laughs> longest trek and where? Uh, longest trek. Uh, probably in Canada, <laughs> in the Canadian Rockies, okay. backpacking trip, okay. yeah. Okay. One piece of advice you'd give to students wanting to study this, uh, your field? Uh, take math classes. Okay. Be serious about math, yeah. If you had unlimited funds, where would you invest it in at Purdue and why? Uh, my lab is the easy, funny answer. Okay. I'm not sure if that's the, the, the best answer, that's though. That's fine. The, um, mo <laughs> the most challenging part of your work? Uh, time management. The best part? Uh, working with students. Purdue is? An exciting place to be. Awesome. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Marissa. So that wraps it up for our last Cocktails and Conversation for this fiscal year. The next one will happen in September. It, during the summertime, when you have some time, we, do have, we will have all those videos uploaded for you to um, look at. So um, just a reminder that the Women's Conference is on June 8th and 9th. And um, yes, if you could play the video.
So thank you, everyone. If we could just do a cheers, if everyone could just please hold up their drink. Uh, We're going to hold up a <laughs> bottle, water bottle. <laughs> Stephanie's going to take a picture for, as you know, I post this on LinkedIn. Stephanie, just let us know when. Okay. Otherwise, we Okay, thank you. And so that wraps it up. Um, I, we didn't hold our drink up, but it's okay. Thank you so much, Marissa, for joining us this evening. I really appreciate you taking the time to be with us for Cocktails and Conversation. Thanks, Maria. It was fun. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Have a good night. <laughs>